How many of you have never gone there? Just never read it? Oh, well, everybody's read it. Okay, well, I understand. Um, how many of you know that Job was a pretty good guy? You know, when it came to all the outside stuff, Job had his, you know, his ducks in a row and his, you know, eyes dotted and his T's crossed. And yet, how many of you have read all the way to the end of the book of Job and found that God had some interesting conversations with Job? You know, he's, he basically, does it, if anybody remembers, what was the one thing that Job kind of struggled with? I mean, he was good at not being, you know, greedy or lusty or, you know, angry or violent. He did really good at that stuff, you know. I mean, he was kind of religiously put together. But, but what was it that Job kind of missed at? He blamed God for his problems. That's a good point. And, what? He worried a lot. Oh, okay, that, that, that's, what's, anything else? Yeah, he struggled a little bit with humility, didn't he? It's kind of like, I'm all that. I do all these great things. And God kind of calls him on the carpet. You know, it's not that God doesn't love Job or God doesn't restore Job. Because how many of you know that grace is not something that just happened in the Old Testament? Or, sorry, the New Testament. Happened in the Old Testament too. And so God gave grace to Job, but he kind of said, um, buddy, where were you when I made it all? Yeah. And Job kind of goes, oh, not there, you know. And, and so, so God has this conversation. And how many of you know that sometimes God lovingly has those conversations with us? It's not that he's mad at us, but he's trying to say, um, buddy, I love you. You do a lot of things great. You know, I, I, you know that, that's all good. But let me take some of the little layers away and go a little deeper and, and show you some of the challenges that are there. And, and he has a way of doing that, not to embarrass, but to refocus and help us to learn. Now, we, we, I, I do want to make a point here. I am not going to call them out. It, it's a bad thing to do that. But I want to let you know I was really proud of your safety and security team yesterday. They had a day of, of what was called analysis and stress testing, kind of, you know, to, to do what they do better. And they work really hard at what they do. So, so you know, you, you can be confident in the fact that there are godly men and women who come here and, you know, take the time and energy to experience church a little differently so that you can be safer, okay? That, that's a very positive thing. And, and you know what? We can give them a hand even if I'm not going to tell you who they are. But thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for what you do. Now... How many of you have ever used tools? Anybody here never used a tool? Okay. Now, there's lots of different tools, I understand. So what are some of the tools you use? Now, stretch your mind a little wider, because this isn't just, you know, hardware tools, although maybe that's what you use. It can be lots of things. What are some tools you use? Michelle? Books for learning. Books for learning. Yes, they are tools. They can expand our mind and heart. Cassie? Cassie? Books. Books is really positive. Anybody else? Tools you use? Fingers. Because fingers. Yeah, if you were fingerless, it would be a little harder to use the <laughs> tools you do use. That's bite the wrench or something. Okay. Yeah, Kendra. Crayons, markers, and pencils. Crayons, markers, and pencils are great artistic tools. Yes. Pots and pans. Pots and pans to do all the wonderful cooking that you do. Karen. Tape gun. A tape gun. Okay. You stick everything together and make... That's true. Box and box and anybody else. Tools you use. Brent. Wikipedia. Wikipedia. So you can find stuff. <laughs> Everything may or may not be so, but you know more than you did when you started. That's a good thing. Tim. Words and spreadsheets. Okay, words and spreadsheets. Excellent. Anybody else? Yes. Yes, Sarita. Sparingly. I have used a hammer sparingly. Okay. How many of you probably should have used the hammer more sparingly than, than you did? Okay, that, that can be true. So there's so many different tools. Obviously, there are tools that help you to apply force, help you to amplify your force. There are ones that help you shape your words, your presentations, you know, shape, organize your data. There are, there are tools that can help you understand your own mind and thinking. How many of you ever used some of those tools? A little self-analysis, what's kind of going on in here? Yeah, okay, tools matter. Tools are things, again, that help us to interface and interact with our world. Now, today, we have been talking about being ambassadors. And I'm going to do something that some of you have heard before. I know you have. In fact, I'm going to assume the best thing. I'm going to assume that somewhere you still have these notes. 
But since the last time I touched this topic in this way was 2015, I'm going to assume most of us maybe have lost our notes. How many of you have ever had notes that you thought were great for about five minutes, but you know, it doesn't matter who said it. They just get lost, right? Okay, and so we're going to do it. Now, that said, one of the tools that a doctor can use to help us be healthier is a physical. How many of you had a physical within the last 12 months? How many of you have been a while? Because you're perfectly healthy and you don't need one. Right? Okay. Should healthy people have a physical? Yes. Why? Make sure you're still healthy. Okay. Um, are there things that you could have that you don't know about yet? Yeah. So it becomes preventative, right? Um, uh, is it nice? I mean, let's admit it. Nobody really, unless there's something wrong with you. I mean, like mentally wrong with you? I don't think that anybody really wants to go to the doctor and get poked and prodded and have to run tests. I mean, I, I don't know, anybody here, you just love needles jabbed into you and you just think it's fun. To, All right, a couple of you do. Okay, well, that's great. Most of us, not so much, right? And it's not a big thing. But it is kind of nice to get the report. How many of your doctors send you a report afterwards? You know, and it kind of lets you know probably you're not going to explode in the next 10 minutes. Or <laughs> It's good to know and there's nothing critically wrong and we're thankful for people that do that. And the point about doing it every year is so that you get an idea of a baseline, right? Because how many of you have ever had some of your numbers at a physical be a little higher or a little lower than the doctor wants? But the next time they realize it's just kind of your, your, your cycle, the way your body works and they don't worry about it so much. Okay, so what I'm going to talk about today, I have talked about before, and yes, you might have a series of notes, and no, I didn't go back to it because I couldn't come up with anything else. <laughs> In fact, this took me quite a bit of work to reconsider and understand, and I've reorganized it a little bit. So I'm going to pass out a note sheet that you've seen before, but we are not going to deal with these things in the order that they are on the sheet. So I'm going to tell you what page they're on, and I'm going to ask you then to go to it, and if you have to share a page, please do. And even if you are not necessarily a note taker, again, I don't ask you to take notes because I'm fascinated with myself. <laughs> I don't think that what I say is so terribly, that I'm saying it is so terribly important that you need to write it down. But I think this is helpful to you because how many of you have ever, oh, this is a question. How many of you have ever forgotten something that I've said? If everybody does not have their hand up, we're struggling with honesty. We, I forget some of the things I've said, and I said it. So, so it's okay. So let's go ahead, and, and even if you have another two sets of these notes, because I did this in 2005, you know, I bet you do. You're pretty organized. But we're going to go ahead and look. Now, one of the things I want to talk about, this is spiritual gifts, and spiritual gifts are tools. We said that every Christian is called to be what? I've used the word several times. An ambassador. an ambassador. How many of you did not get a sheet? Okay, I will make sure I make more sheets. Um, maybe somebody can zip this back and run some copies. Is that possible? We'll have a little time. Thank you, Pastor Brian. He'll make some. So we need maybe 20 more. I thought maybe I'd have enough. Okay. We, what, what are some of the... We are called to be an ambassador. ambassador. How many of you know you're an ambassador whether you want to be one or not? Okay. You're, how many of you are human beings? Okay, yeah, I assume. Yeah, me too. Um, how many of you would like to think that you're generally pretty good human beings? Good. How many of you have ever had an off day? Yeah, I have. There are days when I'm, you know, probably I'm not the nicest human being. And, and, you know, it's just because I'm grumpy or I'm in a hurry or I'm, and it really it's kind of hard. And how many of you think that you're representing God maybe better than you really are? Okay. We try. Trying is good. I understand. That. Okay. So it is something. So we need to use the tools that we have. We are going to be an ambassador whether we think we're representing God or not. You are representing, when people look at you, remember, unless you are totally cutting God off, unless you are embarrassed about God and you're intentionally soft-pedaling everything, then you are going to represent him positively or negatively, whether you're thinking about doing it or not. And what happens if you totally soft-pedal God and don't represent him at all? We use the, the, the verse... Last, last week, 
if you are embarrassed of me, God says, I'm embarrassed of you. Oh, fair enough. Okay, so I mean, we are, we are called to do this, and we're going to do it well or badly. So these are the tools. One set of tools was the fruit of the Spirit. How many of you remember that the fruit of the Spirit, everybody can develop? Kindness. You can do that. Self-control. You can do that. Goodness. You can do that. I'm not saying that all of them are easy. Maybe some of those on the list are real simple for you and you're wired that way. I asked last week how many of you are kind and some of us, yeah, pretty much I am. And, and some of us, not so much. <laughs> how many of you are self-controlled? Some of us, not so much. But no matter where we start, we all have the ability. It does not require angel visitations or Holy Spirit, I mean, you know, power to do that. You have the power to learn to develop and walk in the fruit of the Spirit. We're all on the same page? So this is a tool you can all use. As Sister Sarita said, I sparingly use the hammer. How many of you have ever used a hammer? How many of you pretty much know how to use it? The flat end hits the nail. The claw end, not so much. Okay, okay, so we're all on the same page. Does it require rocket science to, to deal with? How many of you have ever used a power hammer? Do you know what I'm talking about when I say a power hammer? That's a specific piece of equipment. Okay, not quite. That, that's a good guess. That, that is power applied to, you know a power hammer is actually a forging tool? It's a multi-thousand pound object that rams molten metal, and a blacksmith uses one. Now, how many of you used a power hammer? Okay, one. I mean, most of us, not so much. It's not really our thing, right? So the gifts of the Spirit are those things which God distributes. These are tools in his toolbox that he makes available to us. But everybody does not have all the gifts. Paul the Apostle had a lot of them, but he didn't have all the gifts. Can anybody remember one of the gifts he said he wasn't so good at? Trivia question for the day. Mercy. Yeah, Paul not so merciful. Paul, you know, pretty much, I mean, you know, he got irritated. A guy named John Mark didn't toe the line, and Paul really didn't want him to go on any more missionary journeys, and thankfully the Holy Spirit softened his heart and things got better. But, I mean, Paul's not necessarily a merciful guy. That's, that's a gift. So we're going to go over the tools that are in God's toolbox. I believe everybody here, God gives gifts. However, I don't necessarily know in any crowd that everybody here knows your gifts. And here's another question. It's not accusatory. It's observational. I'm not sure that everybody even who knows their gifts uses the gifts. Right? Okay. Now, Again, I'm in a congregation. I have seen some of you use your gifts in absolutely amazing ways. I've had the privilege and the opportunity to see that. I know you know what God does in your life. I know that you're confident and that you use it on a regular basis, sometimes here, sometimes other places. Some of you may have these gifts, and you may use them, and I just don't get a chance to see them. But I think that sometimes God gives us gifts that we put in a drawer, don't we? Because we're a little worried that we might be called on to use them here or elsewhere. And we're a little worried about doing that. So maybe if we keep them off the radar, nobody will ask. All right. I'm going to break these gifts down into five categories and they will not be in the order that you have them. So what I'm going to try to do is explain the gift, give you some ideas that will help you understand whether this works for you, whether this might be your gift or not, and some of the dangers. Because every tool has its things you have to be aware of, right? Okay. Number one, these two, the first two, are the building blocks for all other spiritual gifts. I call these the little two-slot Legos. How many of you have ever played with Legos? How many of you know there's some fancy Lego pieces, the little guys, the little cars? You don't get a lot of those. But you get a million of the little two-slot Legos. Why? So you can step on them. Okay, what else? To make you ask questions. 
They make small details. They are necessary. I don't care if you're building the Lego Eiffel Tower or the Lego Space Shuttle or the Lego Yoda's head. We used to have one of those. It was kind of weird. And, but everybody <laughs> needs the little two-piece Legos, the little two, you know, not everybody. you got to have those, and there's a zillion of them. God gives these first two gifts because they are the building blocks for everything else. And quite frankly, about half of the body of Christ has one of these two gifts. You may have other gifts, you may have other gifts you like better, but I almost guarantee you have these. You have these not because there's anything wrong with you. When I give you these two gifts, some of you will go, I don't want that one. I want a cooler one. I want that awesome gift that everybody pays attention to and they clap for. I'm not necessarily interested in these two. But these two gifts are given not because there's anything wrong with us, but because God knows these gifts are the most needed, like the little two-slot Lego. In any situation, whether you're with church people or total unbelievers, these gifts are the ones that communicate God's love and build community the clearest. So if you have one of these, please don't sit on it because you think it's not important. The first one is on page one. We'll start on page one. That's easy. That is the gift of helps. The gift of helps. The definition. The gift of helps is the distinctive ability to work with and support other Christians' ministry efforts. How many of you know that the key to the gift of helps is you're willing to work at it, but you don't have to be the leader? You don't have to come up with the idea. Somebody comes to you and says, help with this this kid's program. And you go, okay. Help shovel your neighbor's snow. Okay. Okay. You don't have to think it up. You're not necess- you might be a sensitive person. You might be very observant. But this is just not the thing you have to do. You're willing to step in and make a difference. The joke here is that the, the person that does this go stack chairs. <coughs> kind of a church joke. If you don't get it, that's okay. <laughs> go stack. Well, dude, you're just going to make me stack chairs. <laughs> How many of you know if you have this gift, you don't just have to do you know, whatever anybody tells you to do. But you do get a chance to help, to put your time and energy. If we don't have the gift of helps, things don't work well. The purpose of the gift, the first blank, to enable other Christians to be more effective and fruitful, fruitful in ministry through the accomplishment of practical and necessary tasks. Fruitful. Cautions about the gift of helps. A, thinking it's a lowly gift. All I do is help. It's not very important. I haven't saved my whole town yet. I haven't had a great message in tongues. Nobody's got healed because of me. I just help. Sweetheart, if you don't help, it doesn't get done. Somebody's got to help. So if you have been here a million times, somebody's got to help. And I'm not saying it's whether it's here or someplace else, but somebody's got to help. And if you're brand new today, and whether you come back or say, I'm never doing this again, I, I, wherever you go, you need to help. God calls upon you. None of us are so good that helping is beneath us. Second, B, caution, missing the big picture. Because I'm involved in my little thing. Because I just help teach this class, I don't understand what kids ministry does. Because I just help with this youth event, I don't understand what Epic does. Because I just help fold the bulletins, I don't understand what my church does. The picture is bigger than the slice you have. Don't miss it. C, an inability to say no. How many of you have ever allowed yourself to simply become overcommitted with helping? You got a good heart. You want to take care of people's needs. You know there's a million needs. Here's a question. Can you feed the world? No. Can you feed somebody? Yes. Should you not feed somebody because you can't feed the world? So you have to understand where your boundaries are. God rarely is going to ask you to sell everything you own. I know there was one guy that was asked to do it in Scripture, but there was a specific point to that story. He is rarely going to ask you to sell everything and give all your food away and starve yourself and your family to feed everybody that you can. But you can help somebody. That is possible to do, and you should. Three, evidence that you may have the gift of helps. A, you enjoy helping others complete 
specific tasks. How many of you have ever seen a job unfinished and your OCD kicks in? <laughs> got to help. You know, got to get that done. All right. Complete specific task. B, you don't need much public recognition. Doesn't mean you shouldn't get any. Doesn't mean you don't deserve any. But if you're somebody that just constantly is looking around for applause, this is probably not your gift. Because you'll be frustrated about not getting the applause sometimes, and you'll fail to see the point. C, other people give you opportunities to help them. Now this is a good point. How many of you probably shouldn't be singing in a choir? Okay. How many of you probably shouldn't be working on somebody else's car? Okay. Doesn't make you a bad person. Okay. Now, if somebody just doesn't want you to help, probably you are kind of like not gifted that way and things blow up when you touch them. My neighbor came over to help me plow my driveway unasked. He's going on to be with Jesus. He was a nice guy. He sees me out leaning on my shovel one day because, you know, I, my drive was 135 feet long and it goes downhill. And so I'm shoveling down by 59 where, you know, the plows throw it in. And I think he felt sorry for me. And he came over with his big truck and his big blade and he said, I'll plow your driveway. This is not Fred. Fred has done this right for me many, many times. This gentleman started doing it. How many of you know you have to be careful when you're backing a truck down a dark driveway? He high-centered his truck on the snowdrift. And the poor man had an injured leg. He couldn't get out and do anything about it. So I had to crawl under his truck with my snow shovel to get him off the... And where did I have to throw it? Into my driveway. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, he said later, he goes, I I'm sorry. He did finish the driveway. Now, okay, did I ever ask him to help plow again? Well, no. <laughs> nice guy. Love him to death. You know, just that, that just wasn't his thing. You know, it, it's okay. Okay, so if people are giving you opportunities, it might be because you're good at it. D, you possess a servant spirit. You're not, it's not necessary to you to lead, you don't have to lead the charge every time. You're good with that. E, you tend to be available and reliable. Available, and, now if you never have any time, you probably are not a gift to helps kind of person. But I do warn something. How many of you know that there are, there are things that we do that take up our time that we really don't have to do? Can I, can I can be honest with you? Everything we do in America that we say I have to is a choice. Oh no, my job. No, Hey, you even choose whether to go to work. It's a good choice. It's a smart choice. It pays the bills. I'm not knocking that. Not going to work has repercussions. I encourage you to do it. But how many of you know that generally you choose the career field that you work in? And you choose the schedule that's kind of connected to it. And if you really didn't like it, you'd choose something else, wouldn't you? Or at least you'd try. Okay. So to say I don't have any time, you have to analyze whether that's because I don't want to have any time or because I simply don't. All right, that's the gift of helps. Scripture for that, let me give you a, a scripture for that. This is Acts 9.36, and it describes someone. At Joppa, there was a certain disciple named Tabitha, which is translated Dorcas. I think she should have stuck with Tabitha, that's, that's better. <laughs> this woman was full of good works and charitable deeds, which she did. This is a description of somebody who's walking in the gifts of help in the very beginning of the church. Tabitha is a woman that understands that she has gifts and abilities and she can use them. She didn't wait to get an invitation, come speak at our helps conference. Instead, she simply got involved with the talents that, you, that she had. How many of you have talents? Question is, you don't have to answer it to me. Are you using them? Are you using them to help others? Good question. The next gift we'll talk about, the gift of service. This is on page two. If you flip it up, first page, back of that page, should be page two. The gift of service. The gift of service is the distinctive ability to identify and meet the practical needs of other people. Now notice, the ability to identify. Now we're, we're kind of changing. Now we're not just following somebody else's observation. Now we've gone into the connection business. I'm now observing what you need. I'm listening to what you need. And I'm trying to help you find what you need. If I have the gift of service, that I'm not just doing whatever you want. 
I'm trying to find out the needs as they are. The purpose of the gift, to bring an overall sense of love, wholeness, first word, wholeness and community to the body of Christian believers. God, and this is one of the keys to the whole set of gifts, folks. God did not save you to be an individual floating in your own world. God saved you to be part of a community of believers. Part of that is, yes, belonging to a church. Yes, I understand that. But part of that is being connected to all of the people that God has put in your life. You're, you're, the community of Christ might truly be among the believers, but how many of you know that that community has impact on people who are not believers yet? And service is one of the ways. Now, if you think that these are lowly gifts, can I tell you this is one of my primary gifts? And I'm the pastor. I, it's just kind of who, it's kind of how it works. It doesn't mean I'm good or bad, it's just the way God wired me. Doesn't mean it has to be how God wired you, but it's not a low gift. Yeah, Ben. I will, sir. Wholeness is the first one, and community is the second one. Cautions about the gift of service. Serving for the wrong or impure motives. How many of you have ever seen somebody that's trying to connect to somebody for the wrong reasons? I want to get money, time, energy, a date, something. <laughs> so I'll serve you, see, see if I get your, your attention. Okay, that's kind of an impure motive that will blow up on you. B, becoming upset or bitter if not recognized. This goes back to the fruit of the Spirit, self-control. How many of you know sometimes, how many of you have ever been kind of acknowledged for something you really didn't do much for? Right? You only did this much, but you kind of got acknowledged for this much. Kind of nice, even if it's, yeah. How many of you have ever got zero recognition for something you did that was actually really hard? Yeah, and if that happens more than once or twice, yeah, it, can, it can kind of grind on you. So if you're somebody that gets easily upset, practice self-control, get a little bit better, or maybe this isn't your thing. C, caution, being overly aggressive in meeting needs. You ever met one of those? They want to clean your house and you didn't ask? I don't mean that badly. We had, the reason I bring this up is this has nothing to do with anybody here. I, we had a guy in our youth group, when I youth pastored 30 years ago. And he was a great kid. His name was Pat. And part of his, he was very OCD. Part of his OCD was he liked everything perfect. And he wanted to come to my house to visit me, which was cool because, you know, he was a youth and I was a youth pastor. And he always wanted to clean my house. How many of you know my wife has a system and Pat's system was not the same? Okay, so did he do a good job? Yeah, but I got in trouble every time he messed with stuff. <laughs> so, I mean, just sometimes you can be a little too aggressive. Let me fix your car. I don't want you to fix my car. My car is good just the way it is. Let me teach you Greek. I don't want to learn Greek. <laughs> don't be too aggressive. Three, third, evidence you may have the gift of service. Number one, you easily identify the needs of others around you. You easily identify. If you don't have a clue what the needs are, you're probably not a service-gifted individual. But if you walk into the room, pretty quick, you can nail it down. This is what's needed. This is what's necessary. B, you have a genuine desire to serve others. You just find that that's how you work. Desire to serve others. The last blank, because D doesn't have one. C is you gain a sense of satisfaction and joy through serving others. Satisfaction and joy. Again, this is kind of how I'm wired. So I'm sitting there yesterday ringing the bells for Salvation Army at Walmart. In the rain. No, it's okay. It rain was fine. At least it wasn't below freezing. How many of you have ever done a service project for somebody when it's freezing? I know somebody who was doing it just the other day. I was with them, and they were doing all the work, and I was just holding the ladder. And, and you know, it was really cold. And they were just, it was amazing to watch what they were doing. You know, it was a lot of work. Um, it, it can be, though, you get a satisfaction from it. And he did. He was really satisfied that he could help in that way. And you know, even, even the, I, I have fun. How many of you ever watched grumpy people walking into Walmart? <laughs> and it would have been so easy to say, you want to give money? You want to give money? I never mentioned it. I just, hello, how are you today? Oh, I hope you have a great day. 
you know, and just to see the smiles or the surprise or whatever else, you know, it was small, it was no great sacrifice on my part, I was already out there, might as well be nice. And it was amazing how many people like walk out like, well, here's a buck. Cool, thank you, that makes all the difference in the world. It does. It's just kind of fun. So if you find satisfaction, that's a good thing. These are the two slot Legos that make everything work. And probably 50% of you have one of those gifts. Now the next category of gifts are gifts that connect people together and help grow community. And if you didn't get landed in the first two gifts, you're probably going to find at least one of your gifts is going to come out of the next 11. Okay? Yeah, there's 23 gifts. I'm not going to get them all today. Forget it. I've got till the kids program to get these in. So I, I'm not going to abuse your time. Okay? Here's the, the first three of these are gifts that help us share what we know. How many of you know something? You don't have to. <laughs> now, if you are, I mean, I, I imagine that many of you are thinking, well, what I know maybe isn't that important. Or, you know, I really don't want to raise my hand because I'm tired. He does this all the time. Or, well, I, I don't know. <laughs> but I, I hope you know that you know stuff, right? I mean, whether everybody else wants to know what you know or not, you know stuff. You have wisdom and intelligence and knowledge, and you have training in areas and experience in areas. And some of the things that you know, I need to know. And some of the things that you know, the people with you need to know. Because it makes their life better. So the first three gifts deal with sharing what we know with others. The first one is on page seven. I told you these are not, and I didn't reorganize the whole list. It was just easier to leave the list the same. But it's on page seven, and it's the gift of knowledge. Page seven, the gift of knowledge. It's actually, if you're looking, because they're in alphabetical, there's alphabetical order, it's item P. The definition of the gift of knowledge, it is the distinctive ability to seek out, gather, organize, and clarify facts and ideas on a number of diverse subjects. So just because you know stuff doesn't necessarily mean you have the gift of knowledge. But if you're sitting here and you find that you're just always a researcher, Brent, you mentioned Wikipedia. Have you ever gone to Wikipedia and just done the random searches? Yes. So why? It's fun, isn't it? What comes up? What will Wikipedia tell me? And at one point it's a biography, and at another point it's a science thing, and at another point it's something about politics. You know, and you're just kind of randomly chasing it down, and you can find some of the most interesting things. How many of you have never done that, would rather gnaw off your own arm and beat yourself to death than ever go on Wikipedia and search randomly? And it's not because you're not smart. It's because you organize your thoughts and your priorities in a different way. But if you find that you love reading books, I actually sometimes go to the library and just pull biographies off the shelf. I don't even know who they are. I just want to read some, you know? And, and some of you would be like, I don't want to do that, okay? Okay, gift of knowledge, people love to, to dig and research and, and get their facts in order. The purpose of the gift of knowledge to discover, second, the blank, gather and retain new truth and ideas to strengthen and enhance Christian living in the body of Christ. Gather is the first blank. Truth is the second blank. Ideas is the third blank. That's the purpose of the gift of knowledge. Not just to know stuff. The gift of knowledge is not to look smart for other people, okay? How many of you know that if you're really interested in learning stuff, you really don't care if other people think you're smart? The joy is in learning the stuff, okay? Two, cautions about the gift of knowledge. A, gathering information for the sake of information. I call this kind of the nerd syndrome. <laughs> B, Pride or arrogance. You just love to show everybody how smart you are. C, so heavenly minded you are of no earthly good. These are dangers of the gift of knowledge. You get people that want to talk theology all day, but they've never done anything with it. That doesn't help, does it, Pastor Dan? Just doesn't help, okay? Three, evidence you may have the gift of knowledge. A, you enjoy study and research and do so for extended periods of time. 
So if you last read a book three months ago, if you looked at Wikipedia when you were in high school and haven't touched it since, probably not your gift. Okay? Second, you are able to retain large amounts of diverse information. Large amounts of diverse information. All kinds of stuff you're interested in. C, you tend to be inquisitive and reflective. You want to know. You're digging. Inquisitive and reflective. D, you desire to gather facts in a logical pattern. How many of you ever gathered facts in a non-logical pattern? How many of you have ever forgotten most of those facts? Because A didn't connect to B, it didn't connect to C, right? So it kind of helps to tie them all together. E, you have a passion to learn. Now, how many of you knowledge, know that knowledge is great, but knowledge kept to yourself, not so much? I know this is, this is one of those knowledge bits that interests me, it may not interest you. But I'm going to give it to you anyway, because I can. How many of you know that the fundamentally most Middle Eastern militaries aren't very good? <coughs> Historically, there's a reason for that. It has to do with the nature of the culture. And I'm not picking on the culture or being racist. Or, and this is actually comes from a military analysis. Their officers hold power by not telling other people how to do the job. So if I'm the officer that knows how to move the tanks, I don't tell anybody else how to do it. Because if you know how to do it, you might get my job. And I want to preserve my job. So what happens when I die? What happens when I can't get on the radio? I can't tell anybody how to move the tanks. And they don't know how to do it because I don't want them to do it. Well, I don't care because I'm dead, but now they're dead too, so it's bad. So in the American military, we try to make everybody kind of aware of a whole lot of stuff. We want to share that knowledge. Why? Because we want them to know how to deal with the planes or the tanks or the equipment or the food so that they can do their job no matter who's healthy and who's not healthy, who's there, who's not. It's a matter of sharing details. It matters, okay? So we not only want the gift of knowledge, we want what's on page 8, the gift of teaching. The gift of teaching. That's item R. The gift of teaching is the distinctive ability to employ a logical, systematic approach to biblical study in preparation for clearly communicating practical truth to the body of Christ. Now, I'm going to give you here, I, I've missed some stuff. I'll, I'll give this out to you. This is a list of all the scriptures that are involved. There's a lot of them. But I'm going to give you one here. Acts chapter 18, verses 24 to 28. Now a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in scriptures, came to Ephesus. This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord. Somebody taught him. And being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things of the Lord. He taught others, even though he only knew the baptism of John. So he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. When Aquila and Priscilla heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the, God, the way of God more accurately. Somebody taught him. When he desired to cross to Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him. And when he arrived, he greatly helped those who had believed through grace. He taught somebody else. The story here is that there are these people that freely shared and communicated information to each other. Now, how many of you have ever had a bad teacher? Hope it's not me. But anybody has had a bad teacher, right? Somebody that communicated things, you didn't know where they were going, you didn't know why they were going there, and by the time they were done, you had no idea where they were. Okay? I mean, there are people who are not gifted in teaching, whether we're talking biblical teaching or teaching auto mechanics or teaching politics or anything else. They're not, they don't communicate clearly, they don't explain and connect. And then there are people who do. The purpose of the gift of teaching is to strengthen the faith of the body, that's the first blank, the faith of the body of Christ, and help equip the body for mature Christian living. Faith and mature, two blanks. Cautions about the gift of teaching. You may get lost in the details of the study, the details of the study, and get sidetracked from the ultimate purpose of the study. You ever heard somebody do that? 
again, hopefully it's not me, but they get so caught in the details that you have no idea where they are at the end. What's that? Rabbit trails. Rabbit trails. There you go. Woo! B, next page. Place too much ex- emphasis in the glory of being up in front of people. Can I tell you what? There's really no glory to it. And I'm not saying that bad. Okay? It's not, so how many of you know that this is a role? I'm not better than you. I'm not smarter than you. God has given me a gift of teaching. This is kind of my primary thing. Okay, this is obviously, most people tend to think of pastors as servants or teachers. Those are the two most common roles. Okay, this is something I do. How many of you do this? I know we actually have quite a few people who teach professionally or personally in this room. Okay, anybody else? How many of you have ever been a, uh, a director for an apprentice? You've ever taught somebody a new hobby or skill? You've ever taught your kids how to be nice to other people. <laughs> you, yeah, right? Okay, so, so you are teachers. Now, some of you may feel very good at it, and you do it a lot. Some of you may not do it very often. But you, there are many people who are teachers. Okay? Every, sorry, last one. Teaching information without application. And every pastor needs to get a hold of this. If I teach you, you know, some scripture verse, and you walk out of here and have no idea what to do with it, no idea why you should do anything about it, then I failed in my primary job. It may be scripture. How many of you know here's a scripture? Two at the par bar, four west of the causeway, two at the par bar. That's actually scripture. Good luck, go find it. Does it matter? Well, yes, it tells a part of the story. Have I ever preached it? No. Am I doing so now? No. Why? Because you're not going to have any idea what to do when I'm done. (laughs) Is it good? If you fit the rest of the picture together, yes. But by itself... It's lacking context. So it always helps to have application. Three, evidence that you may have the gift of teaching. A, you have a gift for public speaking. You have the gift for public speaking. How many of you would rather not be a public speaker? You're smart, you're talented, you're amazing, that's just not your thing. How many of you wish other people weren't necessarily public speakers? <laughs> okay, again, hopefully it's not me. B, You can study and organize your thoughts in a clear and concise manner. Again, it helps to know where you're driving the boat. Organize, is that word? C, people enjoy your teaching and want more. That's one of those diagnostic things. If you're a cook and people don't want to eat your food, you might need to brush up on your skills or just stop. If you're a teacher and nobody wants to hear you, you should brush up on your skills or just stop. D, you are disciplined and articulate. Disciplined and articulate. I'm going to hit one more. We're going to stop. We'll keep going with these as we go with these. Okay, I'm not in a hurry. We have communion coming. The last one of the, the gifts in this category that helps us share what we know The gift of wisdom. This is on page 7, item O. The gift of wisdom. How many of you have ever met somebody that's smart in one way, but they're dumb as a brick in other ways? (laughs) they got lots of data. They don't seem to ever do anything with the data. Okay? They're missing O, the gift of wisdom. The gift of wisdom is the distinctive ability to discern the mind of Christ and apply scriptural truth to specific situations in order to make the right choices and help others move in the right direction. How many of you know somebody that's got this gift? They're just wise. They may or may not actually have a whole lot of data about a lot of other things. Do you realize it's absolutely possible to be wise without having the gift of knowledge? How many of you know people that just understand life? They're just, they're just good at it. I had a grandmother like that. I had one very smart, very educated, pretty wise grandmother. And then the other one, but pretty much never got off the farm, didn't have really any formal education, and that lady was sharp. She just had a good sense of, of kind of how to live and how to live the right way. And, you know, it just it was amazing. So you can have one without the other, okay? Very possible. The purpose of the gift of wisdom, to apply scriptural truth, apply scriptural truth, and God's heart to everyday situations. 
Not special, climb the mountain situations necessarily. Start with small, everyday situations. So decisions can be made in such a way as to please God. Cautions about the gift of wisdom. Believing you are the source of the wisdom. I am so amazing that everybody should do it my way. Maybe not. B, using wisdom with impure motives. You know who's really good at that sometimes? Sometimes. Politicians. Let me tell you this story. And you know they have wisdom, right? They know the audience they're talking to. Let me tell you the story in such a way as to get you fired up and on my side. Vote for me and give me power. But it's for impure motives. They're not really doing it for you. They're doing it for them. Okay? C, looking down, two blanks, looking down on those who don't have the gift of wisdom. I are smart, you are not. You ever met one of those? A little irritating, aren't they? You don't like them. I mean, how many of you know it's okay to be smart and not necessarily advertise? Yeah. Just share. Evidence that you may have the gift of wisdom. A, making the right decision in difficult situations comes easy to you. Comes easy to you. That's the part I want you to understand. Many of you make amazing decisions, but if it's something you have to rack your brains over and agonize for days and hours and months, you know, maybe your wisdom is not your thing. It doesn't, again, mean that you're dumb. It doesn't mean that you're unspiritual. It doesn't mean you have to feel bad about yourself. You don't just generally say, This is my gift. Because if you find that you make those decisions not only quickly, but accurately and helpfully over and over again, you might have that. B, people seek you out for counsel about their problems. If nobody's asking you questions, it may be a sign. <laughs> now, it may just be that you, they don't know you very well yet. And when they do, they'll ask you. That's possible, too. Okay. C, you have a practical nature when it comes to the application of wisdom. How many of you know that's really where wisdom hits the, that's where the rubber hits the road? It's the practical stuff. How do I have the relationship? How do I get it done? How do I make sure that I'm excellent in what I do? How do I make a difference? It's the, it's the practical stuff. D, you possess good common sense. Good common sense. Here's uh, Paul talking in Corinthians. And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. However, we speak wisdom among those who are mature, yet not the wisdom of this age, nor of the rulers of this age who, come in, who are coming to nothing. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew. For if they had known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, eye has not seen, ear nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. This is 1 Corinthians 2, 4-9. Okay? Again, spiritual wisdom. We're not talking about how to make a good carrot cake. There are ways to do that. I'm not picking on that, and I like good carrot cake. Not my point. There are many things you might be wise at, how to pay a bill, how to get along with your neighbor, that may not necessarily be the gift of wisdom. Remember, the gift of wisdom is specifically for you know, the, the distinctive ability to discern the mind of Christ and, and to apply scriptural truth to specific situations. So it depends on what you're trying to be wise about. Okay, stop here for today, because we're going to go to communion. However, I want you to think about this. How many of you have heard at least one thing in the five gifts talked about so far, and you go, that might be me. Okay? Second question, perfectly fine if you say yes to this question because there's a lot of gifts to come. How many of you said, I don't think so? So far, I haven't heard anything here that really jumps off the page and grabs me. Okay. There are uh, 18 more. We'll get to you, I promise. Okay? 
What these things are trying to do, what I want you to do as we close, because this is a little different sort of a lesson. This isn't so much come down and pray about it. And we'll do that at the end. I mean the end of the series. But what I want you to be able to do is start thinking, what might God be ready to do in me? Remember, if you know your gift and you know that you're using your gift, great. How many of you know God might have something else to add to the, the, the puzzle? You might not be done yet. Good. So your listen this time through might be so that God gives you something new. Praise God. On the other hand, if you are here today and you're not sure what your gifts are, or you think you know but you're not doing much with them, if you were here in this first five gifts, how are you going to change that? Because you're an ambassador. So if God is tapping you with a gift of helps, if God is giving you a gift of wisdom, if you have a gift of teaching, how are you using it? How are you using it for him? Saying, well, I help people at work. Well, that's great. But remember, the goal is to help them eventually find Christ. Amen? Amen? That's the goal. So it's good that you're using your gift of teaching to, to share work events. or that, That's cool, and you should do that, and that might be your bridge in. But it's not where the road stops. So if you found it in the first five, awesome. If not, please bring these. We'll make more, because I know people forget, but so that we're not just constantly churning out sheets. Please bring it next week, okay? And, and I'll make this copy of all the scripture verses so you can take it to you, so you understand where all these things are rooted. Let's close our eyes and bow our heads for a minute. Lord Jesus, we thank you. We thank you, Lord, not that I'm up here talking. We thank you that you have given us gifts. That when we came in here, you already had gifts that your Holy Spirit has invested in us. Some of us knew about them. Maybe some of us didn't. Maybe somebody found theirs today. But Lord, I ask in your mighty name that you would help us to understand how to use those gifts that we have or the ones that we'll find in a way that make a difference in the lives of those that we are representing you to. We ask that in your precious name. Because Lord, we're going to represent you to somebody. We're going to do it today. We're going to do it this week. And we want to use the tools that you've given us to do it in the best way possible. Because we love you. And we are so thankful for what you've done in us. God, I ask this in the precious and holy name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Could have our worship team come up before we, we do communion. We have our deacons come. I always want to say elders, but these guys are young. That's great. You're welcome. You're welcome. Scripture says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this, this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. What gift was Jesus described, displaying right there? The gift of teaching. Do you realize that they were sitting down at a Passover Seder? Every one of those Jewish boys had had Passover Seders before. And Jesus was going to reinterpret the bread and the wine in a way that they had never thought about before. And was teaching them some truth about Scripture, the prophecies of the past, and the application of what was going to happen on the cross the next day. But you realize that's not the only gift for that day? Because the disciples were sent to find the room. Is that not a gift of help? 
hey boys, we gotta have we gotta go someplace. Go find it. Okay. And they did. So even just today, two gifts we see in communion. There are others. We practice an open communion, whether you've been a long-term member of this church or whether you have never been here before, as long as you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, we encourage you to come and partake. We'll ask you to receive the elements and hold them until everybody's been served and then we'll partake together, okay? So if you would just come and receive them, you can cycle back to your seat. We'll share the elements together. When the music fades All is stripped away I simply Lord Jesus, you are so good to us You have given us so much And Lord, we hold the memories The, the touchstones for that Lord, our bodies have been broken and hurting. We have been sick. And Lord, you have taken care of us in so many ways. And Lord, we reach out to you and we ask you, Lord, to continue to do miracles in the lives of people. People that are preparing for surgery. Lord Jesus, people who are far away that we love and we care about. And we need them to be well. God, we bring, Lord, this piece of bread to memory. None of you, you always know that you heal. But Lord, in our mind, let it build our faith by stimulating our memory of the times you have graciously intervened in our physical nature. And we ask you that you would touch those that are ill and, and Lord, suffering and pain today. We trust you for this in your mighty name. Can we partake of the bread together? Thank you, Jesus. And Lord, we also hold the cup. And we are so grateful. We didn't earn salvation. You weren't up there in heaven saying, oh, i got to have him. You instead came out of love. And you died on a cross so that my sins could be forgiven, so that all of our sins could be forgiven, so that we don't have to carry the guilt ongoing, so that when the enemy pokes us and tells us that we're no good and, and that we failed here or there, we can say, I'm pretty sure I remember God says he doesn't remember that. That, Lord, he, you see the wisdom of Jesus Christ, and the, not the wisdom, but the, 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 the goodness, the, the righteousness of Jesus Christ in us. Thank you. God, I ask you that you would reach out and touch those that we know, that we love, that we care about, that we're aware of, Lord, that do not know you yet. God, I pray that you would give us wisdom, that you would draw not only us, Lord, but so many other believers around in such a way that these people were praying for this morning would hear your word and see your example over and over and say, I've got to have some of that God that they're talking about. Lord, I ask you that you build relationships with them through us. We thank you for your goodness. Lord, we prepare to partake this cup together, thankfully acknowledging what you've done in your name. Can we partake of the cup together this morning? Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you. Lord, we thank you for the gifts that you've given to us here. We thank you for the gifts you've given to us in your Holy Spirit. And we look forward to going out there and seeing how you use the gifts that we know about. In your mighty and holy name.